Good morning. My name is Regina Heberlein. I'm a metadata specialist in the Department of Special Collections at Princeton University. And it is my great pleasure to talk to you today about a project we're involved in, um, in that we are a participant in the Linked Data for Production Initiative. Um, our group consists of five people, Joyce Bell, who is our project lead, Jennifer Baxmeyer, Peter Green, Lydia Santarelli, and myself, and also until March of this year, when he defected to Yale. Um, um, Tim Thompson was also a member of our group. Um, many of you will know this. Um, our group is part of the Mellon-funded Link Data for Production project, which actually includes six research libraries. So. Um, Columbia, Cornell, Harvard, Library of Congress, Stanford, and Princeton. And the purpose of the grant is to explore ways to move from mark-based production workflows to production workflows based on linked open data. Um, each partner library in the grant works independently on a local use case, and that includes the data modeling and, as the case may be, the domain-specific ontology development. LD4P is also part of the larger LD4 family, which includes the Mellon-funded Link Data for Libraries, LD4L, which concluded in 2016, and LD4L Labs, which runs 2016 to 2018 and is focused on uh, tool production. Um, LD4P is a two-year grant that started in April 2016, so we're fast approaching the finish line. Um, so Princeton is using a selection from the library of Jacques Derrida as its project test case. Uh, this is an author library of about 19,000 items that was acquired by Princeton University in 2014. Jacques Derrida, of course, was a French philosopher. Uh, he's one of the major figures associated with post-structuralism and postmodern philosophy. And uh, the collection has met with correspondingly high interest from researchers. Um, the collection includes Derrida's working library, which is one of the things that makes it so interesting, um, as well as books belonging either jointly or separately to Jacques and his wife, Marguerite, um, and in a handful of cases also to their two sons. It includes a variety of formats, um, <coughs> monograph volumes, Certainly, um, serial issues, off-prints, clippings, typescripts, etc., cetera, uh, that were largely accumulated in the course of Jacques and Marguerite's professional activities. But there is also a set that represents the family's leisure reading. This is another view of the library. Um, what makes this collection so interesting from a linked data perspective is that it embodies many and different types of relationships that aren't easy to either expose or let alone make functional um, in a library environment with our current descriptive tools. Um, I'm going to give you three examples, the last of which is our use case. Um, so for example, Derrida extensively annotated his books. So there's a lot of marginalia and also a lot of insertions. And for those interested in studying Derrida's reading habits or intellectual formation, for example, those represent um, a record of a dialogue between Derrida and the text. There is currently another project exploring this at Princeton University. Um, it's called Derrida's Margins, and I believe they're not using a linked data approach, even though I think it lends itself to one. Another really interesting type of relationship in this collection is the shelving order, um, meaning the precise location of the books, because it is meaningful in that where a book was kept, so for example, in the studio or somewhere else in the house, and who its neighbors were, contains information about how it was used by Derrida. Um, I'm an archivist by training, and archivists call this kind of meaningful background context. Um, this is the kind of context that allows you to know what you're looking at, but it is not contained in the resource itself. And so we try to address the presence of substantial contextual information in this collection by treating it as an archival collection. 
Um, so it is described in a finding aid rather than in individual mark records. And that allowed us to display the original shelf order and to allow users to sort by it, among other data points. Um, of course, what that gives you is still basically a browse list, so the functionality is very limited. Last not least, to get to our LD4P use case, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the collection contains a large run of over 6,000 items of books that were gifted and in many cases inscribed to Derrida and also members of his household. Derrida famously never threw away a book, including those he never opened. There are some shrink-wrapped ones that we got as part of the collection and obviously never read. Um, and there has been active scholarly interest in these dedications because they represent a physical manifestation of Derrida's reader network and intellectual influence. Currently, this sort of information is buried in a note in the record. I'll show you that in just a bit. And we really have no mechanisms to include it in our discovery functionality. Here you see some examples. Um, for our project, we selected about 500 of these dedications, pretty randomly, even though we did try to filter out living gifters to be sensitive to privacy concerns. Um, and so the goal of our project is to explore and develop a production-oriented workflow that allows us to capture and make discoverable the relationships embedded in the dedications. And to that end, we have been working at creating a data set that combines in linked open data format, the bibliographic item data, and when I say bibliographic item, I really mean the bit frame item, and entified dedication data. This one is an amusing example, also an interesting example. It's amusing because Derrida has annotated a dedication. And the dedication is pretty warm and cordial, you know, to the effect of ingratitude for your friendship and with my strong and faithful and great admiration, yada, yada, yada. And his response is hypocrite, exclamation point. Um, so this is actually also a very interesting case of a meta annotation, and, <clears throat> excuse me, annotation. And uh, I'll use this example for a while to demonstrate what we can and cannot do with it in this project. So as mentioned before, we currently describe this collection in a finding aid, not in a mark record. Uh, this is a snippet of the XML. Uh, it's an encoded archival description, which is an XML schema for archival data. Um, you notice the big blob in the center there? It's just a string of text. Um, this, by the way, would be a very similarly sad situation in a mark record where this would also be in a note field. Um, the data is completely unstructured uh, and the entities are just embedded in a string. And I've circled sort of the low hanging fruit here even though you could go further. Um, so we developed a data model to structure this data which is based on the W3C web annotations model um, that's currently in recommendation status um, at W3C. And by the way, those of you who attended the IIIF workshop yesterday have gotten a much fuller and better overview of this model. Um, I'll just give a brief summary of what we're doing with it. Um, so the web annotations model models relationships between information objects. And it was designed to model born digital annotations that reference web-based targets as opposed to physical data carriers but it actually generalizes well to a library environment where a catalog, reference, a catalog record references information which could be on the physical data carrier or on a digital surrogate. The spec says, I quote, an annotation is considered to be a set of connected resources, typically including a body and a target, which you see here, and conveys that the body is related to the target. The exact nature of this relationship changes according to the intention of the annotation. But the body is most frequently somehow about the target." End quote. And so this, of course, is uh, equally true for our stringy dedications in the books from Derrida's library, where the annotation, that is to say, 
the metadata package provided by the cataloger references a body, the content of the dedication, on a target, the data carrier or digital surrogate. Um, and then as you can see on the right here, Conceptually, the target hooks nicely into the existing BIP frame structure. Um, I should say that the idea for using BIP annotations came out of conversations between members of my group um, and Tim Cole and some others, uh, and was then uh, developed and published in the Journal of Library Metadata by my colleagues and former colleague Tim Thompson, Jennifer Baxmeyer, Joyce Bell, and Peter Green. Applying this model, to the hypocrite dedication and meta annotation. Um, we see here the anno one or annotation one, the information package regarding the dedication itself. Then there's an anno two, that's the package regarding the comment on the dedication. And then we have an anno three that describes our, meaning the catalog, cataloging staff's entification activities. If I start plugging in some data, this is what it would look like. I don't know that you can really read this, um, but I'll walk you through. Um, so this is Anno 1. Anno 1 has a body called Body 1, which is the text of the dedication. And it has a target page X, and that's because I neglected to look up the actual page number. Um, page X has as its scope Item 1, which in turn is our bib frame item. The purpose of body one in anno one is dedicating. Anno two, in turn, would have as its body a body two, and then point to body one. And it would look like this. So body two, the text of hypocrite, has the purpose of commenting on the target body one, the text of the dedication. This is a very, very simplified view. It's like irresponsibly simplified of how we created and consolidated the bibliographic and annotation data into a linked data record. Uh, and we're still in the process of doing that. So in very simple terms, we started with two data sources. That's a gross lie, but Conceptually, there were two data sources, um, the data for the bibliographic item and the data for the dedication. Um, we modeled one on BibFrame and the other in web annotations, put both through their respective sausage makers, and voila, at the end we got linked data out of it. Uh, this is the non-romanticized version uh, in Peter Green's retrospective workflow analysis. Um, of all the steps that we actually had to take. And the details of this aren't really as important as just showing you the fact of the multiple contortions that we had to twist ourselves and our data into on the path to a consolidated record. Um, I will mention two things, though, that were uh, annoyances or major complications. Um, one is that we, we had to go through Mark to get to BibFrame, um, because right now we can't produce BibFrame natively. And so that, of course, um, is kind of a roadblock. Um, we also ended up having to make our own editor to uh, create the records for the annotations, and I'll talk a little more about that later. This is that editor. Um, it is a tool that Peter Green built for us. So we could move forward because our timeline didn't sync up with the development of the editing tools that are being developed by LD4L. And we just needed something to move on. So there are a lot of disclaimers associated with this tool. It is not meant as a community tool. It's a one-off for our internal use. It doesn't quite do all that we want it to do. For example, it cannot yet accommodate the meta annotation, the hypocrite bit, unless we put it in the code manually. Um, and uh, that is why Peter calls it MacGyverware. This is the landing page. You can expand 
a whole suite of background documents here, including step-by-step -step instructions, and that is because the editor assumes as its users our regular cataloging staff who are not necessarily familiar with linked data. So here, if they want to, they have all the background materials. Um, you can retrieve records by ID. Uh, we're starting from a prepared set of 489. Um, and I've randomly selected record 450 here for no good reason at all. Um, what you get is an image of the dedication that you can open up to double check it against the transcription, um, a text box with the transcription, an identification box, uh, which we'll use in a moment, that's the green box here, and uh, the code template below. Um, the buttons in the center there, both um, are buttons to move to the next step and also show you um, what, you've, uh, what you still have to do, the steps in the process. Um, here you can expand the view of the incoming metadata. So there's a link to the finding aid record, the OCLC record, um, the uh, WorldCat work record, among other things. Um, and then... This is the view of the actual um, dedication for double checking purposes. And assuming that is okay, we can start entifying. And that is done by highlighting the entity. In this case, that's a person. So um, I click person in my, um, my radio button there. What that does is populate the entification field with 12 characters to the left and to the right. Um, and then it appends the code you see below to the template. Um, the next step is to manually edit the template. Um, the dedicatee is presumed to be Jacques Derrida. So um, he's here in an RDA property already filled in. I added a line for Marguerite. I would also have to do a second pass to identify her. I've just skipped over that in the interest of time. And then the author of the dedication is the translator Marie-Claire Pasquier, which we know from the EAD record, so I've given her a VIAF um, URL here too. And then the tool allows you to view this graph, which you probably can't read, but that's okay. The blue bubbles are the BIP frame entities. The red bubble is the OCLC work record. And uh, the yellow bubbles here are what I just did. So there is one annotation motivated by describing, the body of which has the purpose of inscribing. And the other two, where I tag the names, are motivated by identifying, and the body in those cases has the purpose of tagging. And I'll just quickly walk you through this. Um, we are not sending the files to a triple store yet. It all lives on the file system. The tool outputs the turtle file, an SVG file, and an HTML file. Um, it's a BaseX application. This is the file structure. There are two main files, the form itself and an XQuery module. Um, we will make that tool available at some point in the future, just not yet. It actually keeps changing on a daily basis. Um, and finally, just um, a note on our lessons learned and challenges. <clears throat> this is our original grant timeline with our goals. And uh, when we first started the project, we quite <laughs> underestimated how long the data modeling in particular would take. And um, we didn't quite count on having to make our own editor because at the time we were still thinking that, well, something is going to come out of LD4L and we're going to use that, but the timelines just didn't converge that way. So we spent time building this editor. Um, what that in the end meant for us was that we had to give up on some of our goals like um, working on the catalogers workbench editor or um, involvement in rare mat or other community ontology um, development efforts. Um, and also our anticipated use of Vitrolib and Biblioteco. Um, our next steps are now to refine our tool and the production workflow, make our test data set um, available, and then hopefully start building some queries on it. And I'll be happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability, but please feel free to reach out to any of these good people who will probably be able to answer them more competently. <laughs>
Thank you. Thanks a lot, Regine. So, is, are there any questions on this project? Yeah. Um, may I? Thank you again. Uh, this was quite inspiring. But if I was a philosopher, I would be quite skeptical now, because. Um, According to Derrida, I think two people using this tool would um, would make um, would use this tool in very different ways, and I think the annotations uh, that they produce would, would be quite different. So, for a philosopher, what is the outcome of this? Um, I'm going to take the pedestrian approach to this question and say few of our catalogers are philosophers or would take the philosophical approach to this. Um, if you remember, <coughs> is this still up? Um, we have a step-by-step -step instruction manual here. The first bullet point, the how-to. It really tells you what you need to do step by step with very, I, I think, well, I might be wrong, um, but I think it leaves very little room for doubt. So it's just a matter of doing the work of tagging the name. Is it a person or is it a place? Is this person also the dedicator or is it not? And the tool does the rest. So I'm actually a little more optimistic. Now, we've just started producing records this way, so it might very well turn out that you are right and we have to go back and be more restrictive about what we do. But for the moment, it seems very streamlined and I'm a little more optimistic, I think, that we'll get uniform output. Uh, there was a, another yeah. question. Over could you explain a little bit the, the outcome? But what could we expect if you finish the project? I didn't really understand the use case. I'm sorry, but is, will there be a portal? for researchers or will yes. this be part of your catalog or? So the use case is that in the end, you want to be able to query this data, right? And you're, you're right, I apologize, I didn't really um, give examples of that. But you could then do something, if, if we link it to external data sources, that of course is something that we haven't even begun to do. But let's assume we get to that step. We publish our data set. It is, in fact, pulling in data from, say, Wikipedia, DBpedia, from a variety of sources. You could then begin to answer questions like, say, how many people publishing in French alive in a certain time frame and members of a particular school of thought gave books to Derrida? And then, researchers can draw inferences about in which circles Derrida was active, how he was read, who he interacted with, and that sort of thing. You have, do you have your answer? <laughs> uh, is there, yeah, another question. <clears throat> yeah, I, I thought it was very interesting what, what, you, what you showed. And, um, I was wondering on the conceptual model, um, because now we have a lot of data hidden in note fields, in annotations. And, we, and, and I think the assumption still is that you have a work, that's the printed book, and then you have notes. Did you consider the idea that you actually have three works? The, the text, the text of the dedication, and the work of Derrida, and then connect it as a complex work? I was kind of worried that would come up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have and we haven't. It's not like that thought hasn't occurred to us, but uh, it's a little overkill maybe for what we're trying to do, because really all we're trying to do is make entities available for discovery in these annotations. And for that, it seems like the annotation, um, the web annotation model, does the trick, and it's a lightweight, fairly easily implementable solution to what we're trying to do. That said, we keep saying to ourselves that 
we really need to tweak the model and we really need to uh, rethink this and rethink that. So this is not written in stone. But I don't think that at this point in the project we'll go back to that level of conceptual rethinking. Um, we'll just, I think, stick with this lightweight solution and tweak it a little bit. Any question? I just have one regarding the, the big diagram with your, the whole workflow. And I was just wondering, the, the decision to have all these separate tools, was it only guided by the fact that you were expecting something from this other LD4 project? Or, or is it was also because you had other requirements, um, such as having only open source tool? I, I'm, I'm just wondering, in, in the world of tools, whether you looked at everything and nothing was suitable, just what your, was the, the thought process to go for um, uh, yeah, a workflow that is so fragmented in a way? It is. Um, partly it has to do with um, dependencies that didn't work out the way we thought they would. Partly it has to do with the fragmented nature of our incoming data because it really it was an Excel spreadsheet there, a Word document that we had to scrape there. We all consolidated it in a database. It went to, a, you know. And part of it, which is a challenge that I actually had in my notes and then kind of glossed over because I thought, well, everybody has that challenge, is that um, we didn't really plan our project. So this is a project management issue. We didn't really plan it very stringently from the first moment. We couldn't have because we didn't quite know yet what we were dealing with. But if we had been in a position to do that, that would have been, it would have made everything so much easier. So that's part of the answer. The other answer is that it's really, you know, we are, a group of five people. Each of us brings certain skills, basically a certain toolbox to this project, and we use the tools that we find in our toolbox. So if we know how to get it from Excel to this other thing, that's what we're gonna do because it does the job. And so yes, there are a couple of eddies in here, and it's a little tortuous, but it got us to where we needed to be. Had we known better what we were dealing with from the first moment, we would have planned it much differently. Okay, thank you. I think it's quite a good, uh, maybe a good point for people that want to, uh, to start such an, an effort on their own as well. So, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for, for your presentation. Thank you.